Okay, uh, let's get started. So today's talk is actually the uh, introduction to uh, deep learning for speech recognition. And this is a uh, quite introduction part. Uh, first, uh, the, let's start from our usual pipeline. And then which part is as an introduction to be covered. Actually, uh, now uh, we will cover uh, almost all the part uh, with deep learning. Feature extraction will be covered, uh, the, the, uh, the represented by deep learning. Acoustic modeling can be represented by deep learning. Uh, language model uh, can be represented by deep learning. So almost all the components, except for this dictionary part, uh, actually now uh, replaced with deep learning. And uh, I will show you that at uh, today's talk, uh, I will kind of uh, providing the, my uh, personal impression uh, experience about the how deep learning uh, changing speech recognition. And uh, this is again, my personal experience, my personal impression. Some other people may have a different uh, the impression and so on. And the, uh, the, but I will say that this can be a good uh, the uh, opportunity to get this kind of a personal experience. When I was a student, uh, I often, you know, uh, the, attended this kind of lecture. And uh, yes, you know, that I all, almost forgot everything, <laughs> you know, like, you know, usual. Uh, the, but I still remember uh, many of the professors, their personal experience, impressions, or passions. Uh, about some specific techniques and so on. So I just want to kind of let you know my experience, my impression of deep learning, how it changes the, uh, the speech recognition. So this is my intention. Okay, so this means that I try to kind of cover uh, the, uh, the history uh, of my research experience. And uh, this is <laughs> me. <laughs> Maybe it's quite changed. <laughs> yeah, around 2003, by the way. Yeah. So yeah, I started speech recognition this uh, since 2001, so already 20 years. And the, uh, the, at that era, uh, the, as I mentioned, uh, the speech recognition was not a great period. So uh, this uh, curve showing the uh, the performance improvement of the one famous corpus speech board task. Uh, and from the, uh, it's this kind of benchmark is released. Uh, gradually the performance was improved. And uh, around 2000, it's actually uh, stopping the growing. There are some small improvement. This comes from a discriminative training, but basically up to the uh, 2011, we actually didn't have so much progress. And by this era, by the way, people are using the Gaussian mixture model, hidden Markov model, uh, Engram and so on, that mostly covered in the previous lectures. And I think I mentioned already before in my course, but anyway, this is the really bad age. No application, no breakthrough technology. Uh, everyone outside speech uh, research uh, criticized it. And even general people don't know what is speech recognition at that time. So I say that it is one of the very cold age. Yeah, we actually are not so much excited about uh, the, the things. So like, for example, uh, again, you know, this performance improvement is, you know, 0.x percent per year or something, right? Every time I joined the, the, the conference and then just got you know, one technique uh, that got the improvement 0.x. And then, you know, okay, this is our <laughs> technology. So it is a little bit difficult uh, age, I would say. Uh, uh, however, uh, now uh, we are actually at this stage. After the deep learning, uh, we actually get the acceleration of the performance improvement. And we actually can get the quite uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, changes, uh, the big changes uh, in our area. As I said, the, the, uh, everything was changed. Uh, now, voice search and smart speakers, uh, thanks to the deep learning, 
we actually have enough sufficient performance. And now uh, that we have a lot of, lot of breakthroughs. Again, every time I join the conferences, I get uh, you know, a quite large number of improvements. Uh, we still feel like our uh, techniques are not saturated. Uh, and so on. I will explain a bit more later with some examples. So a lot of other uh, technology happens. And uh, many people now like speech. Many people ask me, I want to use speech. Uh, the, I want to work on speech. And many people want to collaborate with us uh, since speech becomes very important technology for us. And everyone also recognize this importance. So this is uh, the quite important. And then now, you know, that my kids even know what I'm doing, which is very good to me. So now the, the cold age becomes uh, uh, the hot age uh, in our area. Okay, so uh, let's start about the, the uh, uh, why uh, neural network was not so much focused, was not studied. Uh, there are lots of lots of issues, and I just listened. And uh, each of the kind of a technical uh, the point, uh, I will explain in the following section. Again, this uh, section. Uh, is introduction. So anyway, my impression was that very difficult to train. Uh, that there are a lot of, lot of hyperparameters just for the optimization, like a batch, online mini batch, uh, the, which one did we, did we choose? And the mini batch, which we need that size we should choose. Uh, this is an important hyperparameter. Uh, gradient descent also has a ton of parameters, uh, learning rate, uh, the, the scheduling, uh, Warm up uh, the, 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 the point, uh, the, the lot of lot of uh, the, the, uh, learning uh, the, the optimizer we have to tune, uh, right? And then the, the, we also have to consider a lot of topology. Uh, maybe I try to kind of explain it with the, uh, the, the Gaussian mixture model, HMM. <laughs> uh, the, uh, we don't have uh, this option, right? We just, you know, every time train the batch. We could make it online, <laughs> but uh, the batch is fine. Uh, the, do we need a, a learning rate or whatever? Probably only threshold we need is to stop the <laughs> likelihood training, right? Uh, we don't have uh, any other uh, the, uh, the, the hyperparameter. And then next, what kind of topology? Neural network has the many possibilities, right? Basically, if we get the function, that get the, uh, the, 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 the gradient, we can combine it. So it can be CNN or it can be uh, the, the uh, field of word or it can be attention or it can be LSTM or even, you know, we can add log, we can add uh, the exponential, uh, we can add many of the kind of operation which we can get the, uh, the derivative. So, so many kind of options for the topology. GMMHMM, what is the kind of our, our uh, the, the topology, uh, the option? Just number of states, number of mixture, that's it, right? Of course, there might be have more time complication, but basically quite uh, the, 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 uh, different from in terms of the topology. And then the, uh, of course, the issue is the large computational cost. Uh, this is very critical. Uh, because we cannot do the trial and error so many times uh, due to the large amount of computational cost. And then another one is if this one is working with small amount of training data, and then we can easily do the debugging, right? However, if we are using the small amount of training data, deep neural network training is not working. So <laughs> we need some sufficient amount of training data even for the debugging. This is also very difficult. So at that time also, we don't have a GPU. We only had a, have to do the CPU to all kinds of training. So this actually makes the deep neural network difficult at that time. And one of the difficulty is again, the how to train the model. And now we know a lot of know-how, you know, how to monitor the training. But again, before that, it was very difficult for us to monitor the training. And then uh, the, this is actually a typical uh, training curve. Blue is the accuracy of training data. 
and orange is the accuracy of other validation data, and higher is better. And I kind of providing the two patterns of this learning guide. And then uh, the, the short quiz, uh, please uh, the, uh, make it public. So the question is, which one is uh, better in terms of the training? Left and right, okay. Left one, right one. And uh, please answer, which one do you think this training is working well or not? Yes. The question says this training is failed. Yeah, failed. Yeah, fine. Yes. I'm it's not working. Oh, okay. How to do it? That's what I will answer. Okay, this makes me everyone sorry. But I just want to see. Uh, this one is fair. This one is fair. Left hand is failed, right? Left hand is failed. Remember that, right? Mm -hmm. This is the most frequent question. My training is failed. Professor TA, how to fix it? Uh, this is the most frequent question. Before asking us, check the learning rate. Learning problem, okay? And then if your training is like this, it's definitely working. Probably then falling or some other inference is wrong. If your training curve is like this, it is over training, right? It's very clear, right? And then I will explain a bit more about this, but how to solve the learning rate, uh, the learning curve issue over training, smaller, making the learning rate to be smaller so that we try not to, you know, uh, going to the a crazy uh, upgrade, right? We could use a drop bar, uh, we could use a spec organizer, we could regularize our training, right? So actually learning curve tells us a lot of again please remember before I be like asking oh my training is not working <laughs> to us please check uh, the, the learning curve. Okay. This is the most frequent question. So uh, I think some of you here are actually working with me, right? And I mentioned that, you know, instead of asking the question, you guys just face learning curve. <laughs> this is what I will do. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that explains many, many things. Let's do that. And checking the learning uh, the curve uh, the frequently. For example, ESPNet usually has a, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, dumping the, uh, the PNG file that uh, the, uh, the information about the learning curve and so on. So you guys can uh, the monitor it or any of the tensor board or whatever, you guys can easily monitor it, right? Uh, please do so. Okay, so everyone was correct anyway. <laughs> <laughs> People, everyone understand it, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So next, uh, the okay, uh, the, still uh, the, we are talking about the, the before the deep learning. Um, actually, deep learning was well. It at that time it was not called deep learning, you know, artificial neural network or whatever, but uh, it's actually not old. Uh, not new. It was actually all the technique uh, the, uh, before uh, the, we established GMM HMM. Before we established GMM HMM, we also have a HMM, GMM, but we also have a neural network studies, especially in the, uh, the, the late 1980s. 
uh, we have a lot of uh, deep neural network. So when I started uh, the speech recognition, actually many people told me that no, no, neural network is an old technique, <laughs> not new technique. So the, instead of using this kind of auto technique, let's use the maximum likelihood. Very cool. We can have a solution, right? Uh, that is what I was actually learned. And the people really believe that GMM is better uh, than uh, the neural network. <clears throat> but uh, however, at that time, we didn't get the, uh, the, the improvement. This is really true uh, due to the previous reasons. We actually didn't get the, uh, the very good uh, the the other uh, 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 gains, except for several other uh, uh, the, the the trials. Again, the uh, one of the faculty here, uh, the professor Alex Weibel, uh, he's the one of the most famous person for uh, actually uh, the, uh, the proposing the time neural network. This is one variant of the uh, convolutional neural network, and this is actually 1989. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, proposal. And then showing the, the significant improvement. Uh, but at that time, again, uh, the, we couldn't scale it to the large uh, the, the problems. And then people gradually kind of moving to uh, the, the, the GMM, HMM. So if we want to know the, the, the episode about these kind of things, you guys can also talk to the, the professor Weibel uh, directly about it. And then the actually the uh, the uh, one of the um, uh, situation was changed uh, by uh, the, the deep learning. Uh, by the way, this work, this phony recognition using time neural network, we already have a one another important person that's making a breakthrough in deep learning already, which is uh, Jeff Hinton. So Jeff Hinton actually uh, and his group, or uh, the people working on the, uh, this area, uh, the, the, uh, together with Jeff Hinton, I would say, it's not only for him, it's not only for his group, it's actually by the many of the community effort. But anyway, the, by uh, the, doing this kind of community effort, uh, the, there is a one interesting paper that uh, came out in 2009. That is the, to use the deep belief network for phone recognition. And actually this one, TIMIT is uh, regarded as a very small scale experiment. And the people don't care so, didn't care so much about the performance. People were caring more about the large scale experiment. So this is the reason that this one was not really uh, the, the, uh, the affect the community. But at that time, at least many researchers noticed that this work, it seems like deep learning can do uh, better than HMM again. And I actually also recognized uh, that this uh, paper 2010 at that time. And what they are doing is that, again, the, at that time, uh, deep learning training is very, very difficult. The most difficult part is that tuning. How to tune the model? And why tuning is required? Basically, all the optimization techniques and so on, we need a careful initialization, and then we need a careful other uh, training and so on, right? So this uh, the, the tuning part, if we have a better uh, the initialization, actually we can mitigate uh, this problem a lot. So their approach is actually using the pre-training. They first pre-train the neural network and then uh, fine tune the neural network to our target. And the pre-training was generally easier, like using the, uh, the deep brief network or shallow neural network, and then gradually making it deep so that we can actually make it train, train uh, this model easier. So this is actually the, uh, the happened around 2008, 2009, and 2010. So people started to recognize that uh, deep learning seemed to be very important. And I still remember that I introduced this paper to the <laughs> leading group <laughs> when I was at the company. 
So that, that's why I still uh, the fully remember that. By the way, at that time, even for me, you know, presenting this paper, I still was not fully really convinced that the deep learning based approaches can replace our kind of technique and so on. However, uh, there are many people actually mentioning about you know, some uh, the, the, uh, the big kind of uh, the, uh, the turning point to uh, recognize this, uh, the, uh, the power of deep learning. And it's happened for me, it's actually 2011. So at that time, I joined the Interspeech. Interspeech was one of the biggest uh, speech conference. And it was held last time in the Incheon. And in this uh, the Interspeech 2011 in Florence, I actually found the three papers. By the way, as I mentioned, already 2009, 2010, many people started to recognize that deep learning seemed to be very good technique. The many people working on it, but I thought that the, uh, the GMM, HMM is better. But in 2011, I uh, thought that the, well, we should definitely work on uh, deep learning because first paper, uh, feature extraction, uh, it's actually showing a quite big up, uh, the improvement by using a neural network. Uh, we call it MLP, but it, we can replace it as a, as a neural network, a deep neural network, uh, I would say. And the other, uh, the second paper is actually quite famous. Uh, Microsoft showing that actually this uh, the, the work is the joint work uh, with the, uh, the, the Hinton group and the Microsoft uh, people. And later, Microsoft scaling this uh, the problem from the small Kimmitz experiment to the large uh, the, the conversational the speech transcription program. So this actually paper is quite famous. Many people probably say that this one convinced us to uh, switch to move to the uh, deep learning. And the third one, third one is actually not the first paper uh, that Thomas Mikolov already proposed this one. But third paper, I actually found that it is very kind of convincing. Uh, he used the recurrent neural network for the, uh, the language modeling. It was already proposed in 2010 and so on. But in this paper, he actually showing that many of the kind of uh, the speech equation tasks seems like this recurrent neural network language model is very powerful. So quite obviously, powerfully, uh, recurrent neural network language model actually improve the performance and so on. So this uh, the, probably not the only for me around this uh, the conference, or even some people even earlier, or some people maybe later, the, in the speech recognition field, people really com, uh, convinced that neural network should be the next trend. And actually many people started to be working on it. By the way, uh, the, what about the other areas? For example, I mentioned this to the, my kind of uh, colleagues in the NLP people, <laughs> but they still didn't convince. No, 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 uh, the text should be shallow. That we should do the feature engineering and the shallow modeling to solve the problem. So uh, the SVM or log-linear model, it should be powerful than the deep neural network. Yeah, uh, I just want to say that, you know, this is more like, you know, uh, the, uh, the biased information of speech actually has a more uh, the, the earlier impact in deep learning than the other areas. So I just want to mention that this kind of, you know, very kind of a transition period. So later, uh, the, the 2012, I actually uh, changed my job and then I moved to US. And then this was a quite a good timing for me to also change the topic. Before that, I was working on more like a generative model deep instead of deep learning, like a Gaussian processing or graphical model or whatever for speech recognition and so on. That was also still a very exciting topic, but I saw that it's a good timing to change my uh, the research. Uh, there. So I actually started to, uh, looking for the, uh, many deep learning uh, techniques at that time. And I actually also joined one workshop, uh, the IWSML, which is 2012 in the uh, ICASP satellite workshop. And then many people actually at that time are, are talking about a, a linear regression problems. Uh, there was a, a panel discussion 
And then uh, the people are talking about the variant of maximum likelihood linear regressions that I explained before. It's in a very complicated math to make one of the only solution <laughs> to uh, get to the kind of EM algorithm for the extension of the HMM. People are talking about this, They're very linear. And then I still remember that uh, the, uh, the, Lutheran, uh, the, the faculty here in CMU, he was actually one of the panelists. <laughs> And then mentioned that why are you guys are still working on the linear models? So that is also very good impression to me. Oh, yes, <laughs> we are right. We are still working on the linear model. But uh, many people are actually working on a non-linear model, which is neural network. So we should definitely work on the uh, neural network. Uh, again, around 2011 to 2012, not only for me, but many people actually had this kind of experience, impression to move to the deep learning. However, my kind of first deep learning experience, you know, uh, is actually one year later, 2012. And then at that time, what's happened? The most famous toolkit, Caldi, uh, in speech recognition, they started to support uh, deep learning, DNN toolkit. This is actually quite a big imp uh, the improvement for the community not only uh, limited people can work on the deep learning, but many people actually can uh, work on the deep learning in speech recognition. So it is quite reproducible and you can show that this performance improvement is amazing, right? This is not like a 0.x, right? Even in the error reduction rate, it can be 30% or 40%. It's quite large improvement. Uh, uh, and that we can enjoy just using the open source toolkit. So before that, only big companies are having this kind of tools. But after that, uh, we can enjoy this kind of thing. But uh, around 2012, other areas also started to recognize the impact of the deep learning. I think that one you guys may know more. Probably you guys also know the, the image net challenge and uh, uh, the deep learning, you know, showing the significant improvement, right? I guess that many actually uh, the deep learning, uh, the, uh, the introduction may starting from this uh, the, the competition, but speech people, actually, we already had this kind of a thing. Uh, and they, the, we already, at that time, 2012, again, you know, already the major open source tool uh, supporting deep learning. So most of people actually are already working on deep learning. And the same happened to the NLP as well. Uh, the, this uh, is again, you know, Thomas Mikolov had uh, already had a uh, quite significant improvement in the, uh, the, the by using a recurrent neural network language model. But uh, together with the, uh, the uh, together with, uh, for example, water embedding examples and so on, uh, the deep learning in NLP became quite popular around 2013. And then the, the, uh, the uh, another uh, the make uh, thing to make uh, the, the, uh, the deep learning to be established in the speech community is that this other uh, paper, uh, Deep Neural Network Work for Acoustic Modeling in Speech Recognition. And this is actually not just showing that deep learning technique, but they, they introduce, they mean the uh, people in the, the University of Toronto, uh, Microsoft, Google, IBM, such kind of leading uh, initiative uh, together uh, to show that improvement is uh, the quite solid for all of their kind of uh, implementations at uh, the, the database uh, products and so on. So this paper is actually one of the most cited uh, the papers uh, in speech recognition now. Okay, so the next uh, the important part uh, is not only for the deep learning technique, but tools and the uh, resources. So at that time, we actually started to get large scale uh, public data. Like uh, the, for me, the, uh, the big impression comes from the test DM data, which is uh, the just uh, the, the, we get the, we downloading the data instead of purchasing the data 
uh, from some other institute. And then uh, we can have a hundred hours of training data. Or uh, the most famous benchmark now would be a Libriski, which is thousand hours of uh, the training data. So this uh, the actually uh, the, the uh, change, the um, access of the uh, resource also happened at the same time. And then together with the previous toolkit called the Cardi, uh, we could actually train the uh, speech recognition uh, the system. It's not super state of the art, but the some sufficient uh, the level of the speech recognition you can actually build by only using one computer. So before that, uh, the, I think some of you guys may uh, the, uh, the, uh, misunderstand that the, the before the deep learning, everyone can uh, the train the speech recognition system uh, because it doesn't require the, uh, the so much training cost. It's actually not true. Uh, the before uh, we move to the GPU and uh, the deep learning, we actually have to use the, the hundreds or thousands of CPUs to train the EM algorithm. So EM algorithm actually is completely parallelized so that uh, we can actually uh, using the super huge other CPUs to uh, train the other uh, speech function. That was the, uh, the, uh, the, the previously we have done. So this means that one computer may not have a hundred CPUs, right? Uh, so that we actually have to have our many computers. And then uh, we have to actually using the job scheduler, like you know, you guys will enjoy the PST job scheduler, uh, which is still required. Uh, but the, uh, the before uh, the, the we move to the, uh, the deep learning and the GPU, we actually could not make it uh, the, by using the uh, many uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the what, by using the single uh, computer. We have to use a, a multiple other computer. So again, some people mentioned that, no, no, the, after the deep learning, we need a lot of computation so we cannot do the speech recognition research. This is not actually true. <laughs> after the deep learning, uh, we can actually make a speech recognition system easier. Okay, and the, together with this kind of the, uh, the, uh, the, the resources, another uh, the big uh, the change is the toolkit. So many uh, the toolkits started to support very efficient GPU computing. And even uh, the, the starting uh, the very efficient uh, the deep learning training, like including the back, back progression, autograph, and so on. So this is also happened in the, around 2012, 2013. And then we can actually make a big impact uh, in our areas. I just want to uh, ask the question, what tools are you guys not using? Still PyTorch? Yeah. How about TensorFlow? How many people are using TensorFlow? Okay, <laughs> not so many. Uh, Google people are quite <laughs> uh, the, um, thought about getting that. Uh, any other tools are you guys using? We also, you know, introduced JAX is one possibility, right? And the JAX, uh, we also uh, introduced that is one, another important implementation method. If any other people are using other, like uh, uh, MXNet, so no? <laughs> okay, uh, interesting. By the way, I, I have used all uh, this here. <laughs> I used the, I first used the Ciano. How many people know Ciano? Maybe, okay, <laughs> you guys are all. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Keras has, you know, <laughs> Ciano backend, right? Uh, so that's why some people may know it. Uh, CNTK, Microsoft Research, uh, that's, you know, the, the group that, you know, made our breakthrough in the speech recognition, they actually made our uh, tool, CNTK. Yeah, the, however, use CNTK. 
probably only me and the Shankai. <laughs> <laughs> and the torch now becomes five torch, right? Uh, the, uh, I use the Lua version <laughs> of torch. Uh, probably that also people may not know. And uh, by the way, I was actually uh, the frequently using a uh, trainer. <laughs> Have you ever guys used or heard a trainer? Oh, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> trainer is uh, the, actually quite uh, the, the, the um, how do I say, advanced at that time, quite advanced toolkit. Uh, and actually, many of the, uh, the trainer concepts. Uh, is now used in the uh, PyTorch. Actually, the early PyTorch is uh, the fork of the trainer. And then they uh, the, the made it from scratch. And uh, if you check this kind of uh, the trainer and the PyTorch, the, uh, the grammar and the usage is the quite similar. So uh, this uh, the trainer is actually uh, the one of the how to say, uh, the pioneering work for dynamic uh, neural network toolkit. But later, since the PyTorch is uh, almost supporting everything, and PyTorch was faster at that time, so many people actually using the, uh, the uh, PyTorch and so on. So uh, these are more like a uh, the, the lot of kind of uh, the changes happened. Like, you know, uh, the, the technology changes, uh, the uh, computing resources, GPU changes uh, the uh, problem. Uh, toolkit, open source also changes uh, uh, the, the uh, situation. Uh, the end the database and so on. This kind of uh, all the kind of uh, the changes happened one time, or I would say was correlated uh, to uh, make this kind of big changes. And is that uh, everything? It's actually not. Uh, after this one, 2013, uh, uh, I would say that every year I am very excited about uh, some kind of uh, new techniques uh, around our areas. So there are lots of directions, but one of the impact is, I will explain it, uh, the still uh, the many people actually at that time using HMM, as I mentioned. And the uh, HMM is uh, the, the, the actually uh, the established in 1970s. And then the, the uh, people are using, used to using that for 40 years. Or I would say that still many of the systems are using HMM. Although they replacing, for example, Gaussian mixture model to the deep neural network, uh, Ngram language model to the recurrent neural network and so on. They are changing this kind of uh, the, each of the component uh, based on the neural network. Uh, but the many actually systems kept this structure, acoustic model, lexicon, uh, and language model. And actually, this has a big barriers for us to improve the performance. Why uh, this has a uh, the, the, uh, the constraint in the performance? Uh, this is actually uh, one of our uh, the lectures, important message. We use a lot of conditional independence assumptions. So already model uh, has a limitation due to the conditional independence assumption. So we cannot uh, the, the go over uh, from this issue. However, as I mentioned uh, uh, in our lecture, this kind of uh, the problem, uh, this is barrier and this is broken. <laughs> by uh, the, uh, the sequence to sequence network. That, that we uh, the explained that, you know, attention-based encoder decoder or CCC or RN transducer, this actually further changed uh, our technique. Uh, the, uh, well, I don't, I don't know how much you guys feel. From me, for me, you know, it's, you know, there's no progress that in the, until 2012. And then now every year, a uh, lot of actually uh, the, the innovation happened. So again, I'm very excited, but I guess you guys are in this kind of exciting eras. So probably <laughs> for you guys, it sounds like a normal, right? <laughs> but uh, again, you know, we have a 10 years of the, how to say, very, how to say, quiet period. 
And then this kind of uh, things happened every year. And another important uh, uh, the, the big change, uh, that, again, there are a lot of impact uh, that in our areas, is that uh, the, the training method. Oh, still, we need a pair data. We need our, our speech and the corresponding uh, transcription, right? Uh, that cannot uh, change our situation because we cannot correct uh, the, the infinite amount of training data. But this situation, this barrier, uh, this is also barrier, <laughs> was also changed by the, uh, the self-supervised learning. Which is, you know, the one of the approach is using the pseudo text. One of the approach is predicting the future or mass, uh, the, the, uh, the, the regions of the, uh, the, the, uh, the output. Uh, and that is actually uh, the prepared from this uh, the audio data. So it actually doesn't use any uh, the corresponding transcription. But by using this kind of approaches, neural network becomes robust. A uh, neural network actually knows a lot of training data. Note that here, again, we don't need a pair data. So this means that we can actually feed various variations of the data to the system, right? Before that, a uh, model cannot know some particular training data because it doesn't have a corresponding transcription. It is very expensive to prepare that, right? But now uh, the, we don't need that. We just feed in the uh, audio data. Then at least this network started to know this uh, the data. This is actually quite making the neural network to be robust uh, against uh, various databases and even various tasks and so on. And the, uh, this is actually uh, one of the uh, benchmark that uh, we are actually involved in, a superb uh, benchmark. And the actually uh, this, uh, the, uh, the quorum uh, corresponding to uh, various speech recognition or other speech processing task. And then this uh, the action, this uh, law corresponding to the uh, self-supervised model. And filter bank is, by the way, uh, the, 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 uh, somewhere very, uh, the very, how to say, low point here. So, all the kind of uh, the task, actually uh, the self-supervised learning uh, outperformed the uh, conventional uh, the, the filter bank uh, based approaches. And even uh, the conventional supervised training is also uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, improved uh, by using the uh, self-supervised learning. So this happened two years ago. So it is also very decent, I would say. Okay, so let me summarize uh, today's talk. Yeah, again, today's introduction, uh, the technical details, I will uh, explain it a bit more. So before 2011, uh, the, it is a kind of a quiet uh, the period. Uh, Gaussian mixture model, hidden Markov model, limitation of the performance. And anyway, the, 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 we are boring about this area at that time. I know that many people quit speech and moving to the other areas. But now we, we have a breakthrough in the model. We have a breakthrough in the toolkit, data, GPU, and many other areas are also now moving the deep neural network. And always very exciting things happen uh, to our area. So that is a kind of today's message. After the deep learning, we will change a lot of uh, the, our technologies. And then that is uh, what I will try to uh, the include in the following my lecture. Yeah, that's it. Uh, any questions?